uh, Mark's Gospel, uh, chapter 8. We're looking at the next section of our study, verses 34 to 38. Think about the cost of following Jesus. The cost of following Jesus. If you have your Bibles, I hope you'll find Mark 8. 34 to 38. We have the text on the screen if you don't have a Bible with you. I would ask you to stand with me if you would as we read from God's Word. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? What, will, what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May we take seriously the cost of following Jesus Christ as spelled out in the scripture and as experienced around the world because I'm convinced it's coming here soon. Thank you. Be seated. Now, we're going to look at a portion of this today and then Lord willing come back to it to finish it out in a couple of weeks. But it's important as we look at this passage that, that you know that being a follower of Jesus Christ involves being persecuted for Jesus' sake. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.12, said, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. We've got to know that. Even if we haven't experienced that, we've got to know that. And, and in knowing that, I, I pray that our, our emotions, our passions will be gripped with a desire to know Jesus Christ so as to embrace the pain of his crucifixion and the power of his resurrection and live a life reflecting that desire. It's, it's what Paul said in Philippians 3, 10, and 11, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. In Paul's thinking, knowing Jesus Christ meant he needed to, as, as one writer I read recently said, he needed to hug the cactus. He needed to be willing to embrace the pain and suffering that would come for Jesus' sake, in Jesus' name, as a culture hates God and hates Jesus and hates the Word, and as is going on around the world today in many places. I want you to feel that passionately. And, and then in, in knowing and feeling, there's doing. We don't want to ever be just hearers of the word and, uh, only and, and not, not doers. I want us to develop what Pastor Samuel Lam, pastor in China, I told you we had the privilege of meeting him in Guangzhou, China years ago. And he said to us, to our little group that was meeting with him, and I asked him, I said, what, what word do you have for the church in America? Do you have a message for the church in America? He's never been to America. He's gone to be with the Lord now. And I had the video tape running. And after he made a few opening comments, he said, America must fight off the temptation to deny Jesus Christ in the face of plenty of prosperity, America, he said, must develop a mind to suffer, a mindset of suffering. What we're looking at and begin to look at today, the cost of following Jesus, there are these, these short, pungent statements that Jesus makes that, that to hear them, to embrace them, takes courage and a willingness to sacrifice. They become essential requirements for being a follower of Jesus 
as he has spelled out the terms himself. He's called us to the realization that suffering is not only his destiny, but the destiny of all who will live godly in him. So when we look at this passage, we see four things that I want to call to your attention, and we'll begin to unpack these today. First of all, Jesus sets forth the terms of following him. He sets forth the terms of following him. We don't get to make those up. We don't get to say, well, I'll, I'll follow Jesus if, I'll follow Jesus as long as. We don't set the terms. He does. Secondly, Jesus states the principle of saving and losing one's life, what that looks like through kingdom lenses, through the lenses of eternity, through the lenses of biblical Christianity. Third, Jesus asks a searching question concerning the value of a soul. And fourth, Jesus warns about the danger of being ashamed of him. Let's look at number one. Jesus sets forth the terms of following him. He has just begun to reveal himself to his disciples in the previous passage. Who do men say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And when Peter answers responsibly, correctly, accurately, then he tells them, I'm going to be mistreated by the religious elite of the day. The, pe the, the, the Sanhedrin, all the people look up to the Sanhedrin as the most religious people around. I am going to be abused by them. I'm going to be mistreated by them. I'm going to be scandalized by them. I'm going to be handed over by them to die. I will be murdered. And the religious leaders, the prominent religious leaders of the day will have my blood on their hands. And in three days I will rise again. When he said that, of course, Peter said, no, no, it's not going to be Jesus. We're not going to let it happen. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, you're, you're thinking, those are the thoughts of the world. Those are not the thoughts of God. He's just said that to them. And our text tells us, and calling the crowd to him. So no longer is it a conversation between Jesus and the 12. Now he says, summon the crowds. I know they want to hear me. Bring them. And they gather around him. And the, the import of this, by the way, the significance of this is that what he says next is not something that's just for the 12 followers, not just something for the 12 disciples, the 12 apostles. What he lays down as the terms, the costly terms of following him is for any and everyone who would hear his voice, hear his message, hear his word, and declare in a repenting faith, I will follow Jesus Christ. He called the crowd to him. Remember, Mark writes, we believe, Peter's memoirs. Peter's dictating this gospel. Mark's writing it down. And it's written to Rome, to the Christians in Rome. And when it was written, some 30 plus years, 40 years after Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection, they were already facing being scandalized by the Romans. The Romans accused the followers of Jesus Christ in their city of being atheists. Why? Atheists? Because they did not embrace the pantheon of gods that Rome recognized. They recognized one God and one creator. One God, the God and Father of Jesus Christ. In Rome's eyes, the Christians who received this gospel message were atheists. And they were rounded up and treated in despicable ways. And up until about two, three, four years ago, you could read about first century Rome and go, how in the world could someone claiming to be so cultured, so educated, be so brutal to human beings? Well, brothers and sisters, we don't need to look back to the first century. We simply need to look to the advance of ISIS, ISIL, whatever you want to call them, the Islamic State, the Caliphate. 
week after week, we read with tears, Christians being beheaded, Christian young women being treated in ways so brutal. You wouldn't, you wouldn't speak specifically in mixed company. Drowned, burned, crucified. With this remark from the, from the ISIS monsters. They follow Jesus. He was crucified. They won't denounce Jesus. They won't come and embrace Allah. Let's do to them what was done to Jesus. Crucify them. And there are pictures on the internet of Christians impaled on a cross in 2015. <laughs> Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, the word there, come after. It means to, if anyone will follow me as a teacher. Now elsewhere in the Gospels, this same word is used, but it's intensified with a preposition in the front of it. It's not so here. When it's intensified in the Gospels, speaking about following Jesus, it's speaking of following me to the end. Following me no matter what cost. Here he's simply saying, if you will follow me as a teacher, because in those days, you would attach yourself to a, to a rabbi. You would attach yourself to a, to a master of some trade. and He would be the mentor. You would be the protege. In religious circles, you would have a rabbi whom you would follow. You would be his student. By the way, that's the word in the Greek for disciple, mathetes. Student, disciple. If anyone would be my student, if anyone would take me to be their teacher, he lays down three imperative verbs, three commands, not suggestions, not a, not a smorgasbord, not a cafeteria where you say, well, just pick which ones you like, pick which ones fit your schedule, pick which ones fit, fit your personality. No. Let him deny himself. That's the first one. Self-denial. I want to commend to you a little book. I think you can still get it on Amazon. It's called Shadow of the Cross, Studies in Self-Denial by Walter Chantry, C-H-A-N-T-R-Y. It's about that thick. It's an easy you can begin reading it in the afternoon, be finished in the evening. You can read it before you go to bed, finish in a couple of nights. Studies in self-denial, and Chantry points out in that book the discussion of self-denial that, that, the, that the boundaries, the fence, I think he calls it, of Christian liberty, pardon me, the field of Christian liberty has a boundary around it called self-denial. See, self-denial has two aspects to it. There is an initiating aspect when you first become a follower of Jesus Christ. You deny your nature. By nature, we are all sinners worthy of the wrath of God. We prove that as soon as we can by sinning. When you first come to Christ, you deny your nature. You turn away from, in conversion, you turn from going this way to turning and going about face a different way. And you live a life as a follower of Christ, battling remaining sin, putting it to death, hating sin when you discover it in yourself. That's an aspect of it. Brothers and sisters, it means much more than that. It's not about, simply about not sinning. So I was sharing with one of the brothers recently. If I came to you and told you I had a great week, I drove past several banks 
and I did not rob one of them. That would probably make you wonder what in the world's going on in my mind to think that that was a victory this week. Because you shouldn't rob a bank. That's Eighth Amendment says you shall not steal. Self-denial has this penetrating aspect to it, which is to deny myself and deny yourself things that you could rightfully claim as yours. We can claim in this country comfort. No one begrudges anyone being comfortable. When you get off a, I don't know, what's the mattresses that the sheep always jumping over on the Serta, whatever they are, Serta, Tempur-Pedic, whatever the mattress, when you get off of that mattress and you go into a foreign culture and you sleep on, I think Josh, when you were in Indonesia, you slept on the floor, didn't you, in somebody's home. Deny yourself, that's self-denial. Self-denial means we will battle putting aside what I could claim as mine for the greater glory of God and the advance of the gospel. He says, deny yourself. Now, they lived in a pretty primitive culture, but remember one, one follower asked him, where, where are we going to stay? <laughs> Jesus said, well, foxes have holes to live in, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. We'll stay wherever we stay when we stop calling them to self-denial. You see, folks, the first thing Jesus says, and, and this is, by the way, why I think John Bunyan in Pilgrim's Progress has the, the, the wicket gate, W-I-C-K-E-T, the wicket gate, the small gate, the narrow gate, that you can't squeeze through the wicket gate into salvation with all of the stuff of this world. Jesus says it this way in Matthew 7, there's a narrow way, a narrow way gate. You only get through it when you give up everything that's his and come through a sinner saved by grace. Self-denial. Brothers and sisters around the world are denying themselves pleasures and standing firm, not denying Christ. I, I need to move on. Let him deny himself. That's a, it's an imperative. It's a command not an option. Take up his cross. Now, that whole this discussion of cross is so misused. Well, I've got, a, I've got a nagging wife. I guess that's my cross to bear. That's not a cross to bear. That, that's just a relational issue, you know. Well, I've got this. I've got this disease. That's not my, no, disease is not your cross. Think of the context, brothers and sisters. He had just said to them, I'm going to be handed over by the, by the religious leaders. And I'm going to be murdered. Take up your cross. You see, the cross for a Jew was not a Jewish symbol. The cross for a Jew was a scandalous symbol. In Rome, they would have seen rebels nailed to a cross. It was first originated, the, the crucifixion, as execution by the Phoenicians years before. The Phoenicians came up with a way to murder somebody in such an excruciatingly painful way that it was designed to send a deterrent among the populace lest anyone else have the boldness to defy the Phoenicians. Lest any enemy have the boldness to take them on because they knew if the Phoenician army captured you, you would be impaled on a cross. There are stories about how the Appian Way in Rome often was lined on both sides for miles with people crucified on crosses. Ugly, bloody reminder. But you better stay in line. And Jesus said to them, having talked about his own death, said, you're going to come after me? You're going to follow me? You're gonna, I'm going to be your teacher. You're going to be my student? Then take up your cross. It's a command. Embrace the prospect of death. My friend R.F. Gates traveled to the Ukraine years ago and was there when they had a baptism ceremony in the church. He said they, they met in the morning in, in an extended service, then they went out 
uh, in the afternoon close to dark because at that time in the Ukraine being baptized identified as a Christian was against the law and he said there they are standing at the river's edge and the pastor was going up to each candidate and speaking and R.S. said I couldn't understand him but he said I had, a, I had a view of him very earnest in his face talking face to face with each candidate and said I asked the interpreter what's he saying he said he's telling them you're about to enter the waters of baptism you're going to be identified with Jesus Christ you must enter those waters willing to die and if you're not willing to die for Christ you will not enter the waters folks we have it so easy here And I'm not suggesting we run out and try to find some place that will crucify us. I happen to think if Jesus tarries, the crucifixion will come to this country. It's not going to be many years off to where, G where Christians identified as atheists because we will not go along and embrace the government's understanding of religion. We'll be crucified. But we must have that mindset. We must live as if we're living for another country. Living for a city whose maker is God. Not planting ourselves so intensely in terra firma. Recognizing we are citizens in two places. We're citizens of the United States of America. Great privilege, great opportunity. We're citizens of the kingdom of God, which, which checks and influences how we live as citizens. Of the USA you're going to be called upon or someone you know is going to be called upon to compromise their convictions in the name of keeping their job keeping their business avoiding fines self-denial cross-bearing willing to be carried off and punished because you will not deny Jesus name because you will not turn back from following Christ three commands deny yourself self-denial take your cross. Don't try to escape the cross. Don't try to run from the cross. And oh, by the way, pray. Pray for brothers and sisters in Christ around the world who this day will face their death and their only crime is they love Jesus Christ more than life. Oh, I want to love him that much. I want to love him that much. I'd like to say I love him that much, but you know something? I won't know that and you won't know that until I'm caused to come to die for him. And I pray God for grace for that. And I pray God for grace for you. Grace for your children, your grandchildren. Who, if Jesus tarries, will face what Jesus was talking about here in the first century and what's experienced, we experienced around the world in the 21st century. And follow me. Three commands. The terms. Deny yourself. Embrace the prospect of death for Christ. Perhaps excruciatingly painful, unspeakable death. And follow him. That is, follow his word. Follow his way. Follow his will. When, when his will clashes with your will, it's one of those great opportunities we have to prove I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I don't follow Jesus Christ just in the sunshine and the fairness of day, but follow him when, when my will clashes with his will and I submit my will to his will and make his will my will. Follow him. Christ followers. This generation in America needs Christ followers. 
We've got enough so-called Christians that aren't making a lick for Christ. Christ followers. That's his call. Jesus says, you want to be a Christian? Crucify self. Embrace and be willing to pay it all for me because I'm going to pay it all for you. And follow me. Learn from me. Don't learn from the world. Learn from me. You see, here's what he does in this passage. Because Mark talks about the gospel, the gospel. The gospel is the story of Jesus coming, living perfectly, dying on the cross, rising from the grave three days later, ascending on high, and coming again sooner than we think. And Jesus says, it's about me. The gospel is about me. He chided the Pharisees, you search the scriptures. For in them you think you'll find a way to live. I tell you, the scriptures testify of me. He calls them to a relationship with himself. What about you today? Are you a follower of Jesus Christ on his terms? Do you work Jesus in to your life? Folks who do that are deceiving themselves. That was not an option that he gave. And he hasn't changed the terms in 2,000 years. Follow Christ today. Perhaps you've never confessed faith in Christ. I invite you today. Confess faith in Christ on his terms. Not hiding anything from you. No small print here. I'm not promising you a bed of roses. Not promising you that you'll get everything you want. Not promising you prosperity without adversity. Not promising you health without sickness. Because they're not my terms. They're his terms. Follow Christ on his terms. There is a cost. It's amazing. Salvation is free. Free grace. We do nothing to add to salvation. God did it all in Jesus. Salvation is free, but you need to know something. To experience the benefits of that salvation, become a disciple of Christ, is costly. Costly. Let's pray.